Hello. Today we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3. I think it's a very interesting chapter. There's so much here, we're going to have to go rather rapidly. So I hope you'll follow with your outline and with me today. Notice where it says, See what wonderful love the Father has bestowed on us. This word, see what, is the idea of real surprise and wonder. It's an aorist imperative. Notice, take notice what wonderful love. And of course, the word here is agape. I think it's synonymous to the Old Testament hesed. It's God's unconditional love based on who he is, not on who we are. The word bestowed is perfect tense. He bestowed this love in the past, and the love remains because that's God's nature, and he is overflowing with love toward his creation. Uh, notice where it says, in letting us be called the sons of God. Now, this is an honorific title. It's an aorist passive verb. We're called the sons of God. Can you imagine? We wear a little thing on our shirt that says, the children of God, and such we are. Isn't that amazing? Now, this, and such we are is present tense. If you're following the King James Bible, you don't have that little verse, and such we are. But it's there in the original manuscripts. It's in the papyri. It's in Aleph. It's in A. It's in B. It's in C. Friends, it's the original. And such we are, present tense. Now, this is on call God's children. The concept of being born again or born of God is a recurrent theme throughout this chapter. We saw it in the last part of 229. Now we see it in chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 2, chapter 3, verse 9, uh, twice in verse 9, chapter 3, verse 10. It's a very important theme, the children of God. John uses born of God where Paul uses adopted. It's a metaphor for our personal family relationship with God. Then it continues. This is why the world does not know us. Now, the world's rejection here is not the physical universe, but human society organized and functioning apart from God. You ought to see chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, or in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 18 and 19, and chapter 17, verses 14 and 15. The world. And one of the, one of the evidences that God, John's going to use in chapter 4 is, you can tell who's of God by who listens to them. Now, it continues then. Uh, we are because it has never come to know him. Uh, the fact that it has rejected our older brother, it's going to reject us. Okay? They rejected Jesus. We are to follow his example. They will reject us. Dearly loved, we are now God's children. But what are we going to be has not been revealed. Now, this is very important. Mirror back up in chapter 2, verse 27, it says the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Well, here is John admitting that he does not fully understand what's going to happen at the eschaton. What he's saying basically is that I don't know what you're going to be like then. He's admitting that he doesn't have exhaustive knowledge in the area of the second coming. But what he is admitting is that we are going to be like Jesus Christ. Now, here is the idea. Notice it says, we do not what we are going to be. You ought to see 1 Corinthians 2, 9, where Paul says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Heaven is so wonderful, hell is so bad, that there is not human vocabulary to adequately describe the reality. That's what I think he's saying. Notice it mentions here, uh, because it has never, uh, excuse me, I almost missed my place. Um, going to be has not been unveiled. Now, this idea of unveiled means manifested or brought to light. But we do know something. We know that uh, when it is unveiled, we shall be like him. It's the idea that when we see God, we're going to be changed into his likeness. When we see Jesus the second coming, we're going to be changed to be like him. Now, that's very familiar, uh, very similar, I think, to 1 uh, Corinthians 13, 13. And you ought to look at that. I think it's very similar. Now, you might also want to see Philippians 3.21, Colossians 3.4, and 2 Corinthians 3.18 for the same kind of concept. Then it begins, because we shall see him as he is. And there's where at 1 Corinthians 13, and it's verse 12, not 13, excuse me. Um, and everyone who has this hope in him tries to make himself as pure as he is. Now, the word everyone is also a recurrent theme through here. We see it back in 2.29. We see it in 3.3, 3.4, 3.6, twice, 3.9, uh, 3.10, 3.15. Wh why so many whoever's? John is making strong statements, black and white statements, and he's saying there are no exceptions. 
There are no exceptions. Everyone who has this hope, resurrection day, it's that longing to see God face to face. Now, some of us are ashamed because we've been living, but those who truly know our Christ and are serving him long to see him face to face. Tries to make himself pure. This is a present tense verb. It speaks of man's response. The emphasis here is purifies himself. James 4, 8, 1 Peter 1, 22, and 2 Corinthians 7, 1 also. Everything that God's done for man, God has taken the initiative. And everything that God's done for man initiates in grace. But everything that God has done for man, God asks that we respond to by faith. Salvation, the Christian life, assurance, receiving spiritual gifts, using spiritual gifts, all of that. Now what he's saying here is, that we have a responsibility in our own sanctification. We must yield ourselves to Christ's example and walk in it as the Holy Spirit empowers us. And that's the emphasis here, I believe. Now, in verse 4, by the way, this word uh, makes himself pure. Uh, this is the idea of the high priest that tried to make himself pure by ceremonial bathings in Leviticus 16, using the Septuagint, very significant. Everyone who commits sin, present tense, that's very important in 1 John, we're talking about lifestyle, habitual action, a life dominated or characterized by sin. Anyone who habitually commits sin commits lawlessness. Now, many translations make it, uh, it seem that the essence of sin is breaking the law. The essence of sin is not breaking the law. Breaking the law is a characteristic of sin. Sin is an attitude of rebellion against God. And that's the basic idea here. So what we have here, there's an attitude on the part of those who habitually sin. And that attitude is rebellion, and that's what causes the habitual sinning. Sin is rebellion or lawlessness. Look at verse 5. Um, by the way, this, there's some other definitions of sin you might want to see. Romans 14, 23, James 4, 17, and 1 John 5, 17. You ought to look those up. Uh, you know that he appeared to take away, take our sins away. Now, there's two ideas here, possibly, this idea of he appeared to take away our sins. Number one is the idea of a scapegoat, like Leviticus 16. You might want to see John 1, 29, where John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus is the sin bearer because he is the sacrificial animal. The other ideal is that he took away our sin by dying on the cross, and he bore our sins on the cross. And that's, uh, let's see, Isaiah 53, 11 and 12, uh, Hebrews 9, 28, and 1 Peter 2, 24. And either one of those is possible. A animal sacrifice or dying on the cross. He to take away our sins. And there is no sin in him. That means present tense. There's no sin. There never is a sin. Now, why is that so important? The sinlessness of Christ is absolutely indispensable if he is going to take our place. If he sinned, he's dying for his own sin. If he's sinless, then he can die on our behalf. The New Testament emphasizes that over and over. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15 and 7.26, and 1 Peter 1.19 and 2.22. Okay, now it continues then, verse 6, no one who continues to live in union with him practices sin. And this is the idea of habitual sin. Now, we're not talking about sinlessness. We're talking about a life dominated by sin. The reason I know that is in 1 John 1, 8 through 2, 2, John admits that anyone who says he doesn't sin, he's a liar. So somehow you've got to balance this verse with that verse. Now, this is the passage that many get the idea of sinless perfection from. And it comes from verse 6 and verse 9. Uh, I've done an extensive uh, outline on that, and you have my theological presuppositions in your outline in the background study. If you want a detailed exposition on sinless perfection, please write for the audio tapes where I had much more time uh, to develop this particular theme. I do not believe in sinlessness, but I believe 100% that Christians ought to be sinning less. If you're a Christian, your life ought to be drawn closer to Christ and your walk with the devil ought to be getting less. Friends, it's impossible to continue to walk with Jesus and continue to sin more and more. When we meet him, something radical happens. And I believe this. I believe the New Testament presents us with the ideal that because of who we are in Christ, there is potential sinlessness. 
but practically, I think we're all moving towards sinning less. Please write for the audio tape. I, had, I took a whole 45-minute period in my church just to teach on this little brief passage here, and you can have the fruit of that if you'll write for it. Notice where it mentions then, um, no one who practices sin has ever seen him or come to know him. Now, no practices, there's that present tense, a real play between the present tense and the aorist tense through here. Um, has ever seen him or known him? These are perfect tenses. They didn't know him in the past and lost it. They never knew him. They've never come into contact with him. To come into contact with him means that your life is changed. You cannot meet Jesus and your life not be changed. A changed life is one of the evidences in 1 John for a valid commitment uh, to Jesus. The New Testament does not teach decision. It teaches discipleship. Quite a difference between evangelical Christianity today. Um, now, notice where it says, verse 7, Dear children, avoid letting anyone lead you astray. It's a present imperative. Stop letting them lead you astray. Now, the idea here is that they were being led astray by these false teachers. See chapter 2, verse 26. Now, then it says, whoever practices doing right is upright. These false teachers were saying, I love God, and I, God's given me special knowledge, but they, they live far away from the ideal of Christ. Jesus put it this way, by their fruits ye shall know them. That's what John's really saying. He's saying, you'll know if, they're, if they really are of God by the way they live. Now, many people claim to know God, but you can know in chapter 3, the evidence is, do they live what they say? Now, in chapter 4, it's going to be doctrinal content, but the evidence in chapter 3 is lifestyle. Now, let's continue then. Whoever practices doing right is upright, just as he is upright. Whoever practices sin belongs to the devil. Now, this is just what Jesus said. Good fruit doesn't grow from bad trees, and bad fruit doesn't grow from good trees. By their fruit, ye shall know them. Matthew 7. Read it again. Uh, those who practice sin belong to the devil because the devil has sinned from the beginning. And this is the idea of present tense. He continues to sin. You'll see John 8, 44. Now, basically, I think from the beginning here refers to the angelic conflict before the creation of the world. I believe the angels fell before man fell. Man's sin is a direct result of angelic rebellion and temptation. Now, let me continue then. Uh, let's see. By the way, it says here that he came to undo the works of the devil. This is why the Son of God appeared to undo or unbind unchain the works of the devil. This is the idea not of opening the eyes of lost people, but of unbinding the Christians, for this is a parallel to verse 5. This is not dealing with lost people. This is dealing with Christians who are so dominated by sin. Now look at verse 9. No one who is born of God, that's perfect passive. You ought to see 229. Okay, no one who is born of God, there is no middle ground, makes a practice of sinning. Now in, in chapter 2, verse 1, it's aorist tense which speaks of the idea that Christians do sin isolated, isolated acts of sin. But a Christian cannot be habitually dominated by sin or he's not a Christian. That's what it's saying. Uh, because the God-given life principle. Now, I've got a graphic I want to show you. There are many theories for this. This is a very detailed graphic. If you're watching with your VTR, please punch it on hold and you can read this. There are five different theories and I've listed all there for you. Some say this life-given principle uh, is God's Word. And that was Augustine Luther, and you have the Scripture text. Some say it's the Holy Spirit. I like that very much. That's John Calvin, and you see the Scripture text. Some say it's divine nature or the new self. Others say it's synonymous with being born again. That's what I personally believe. It's another metaphor for being born again. But some say it's a Gnostic catchword that was used to describe the divine spark in every man. The Greek word is sperma, and of course we get the English word sperm from it. That's why I really think uh, that number four is probably it. It's synonymous with being born again, okay? It's using a little more physical literalism as a, as a metaphor. Now, uh, okay, and notice in verse, last part of verse nine is this emphasis on being born of God again because he is born of God. Now, I think number four is the best. Uh, this, is why, this is the way to distinguish God's children from the devil's children. No one who fails to do right is God's child. Present tense, you can tell by their fruit. This is a, a complete amplification of that little passage in Matthew 7 where Jesus said that. It continues, no one who fails to do right is God's child. No one who fails to love his brother. This is because the message, the word message here, this word is only used in the New Testament in John 1, 5 and here in 3, 11. Some have said John 1, 5 emphasizes theology where John 1, 3, 11 emphasizes ethics. Now, it's true that John uses both tests, doctrinal 
and social to describe genuine Christianity. But I think that's probably reading a little too much into this word. That you have heard from the beginning is this, that you should love one another. I want to tell you the only evidence that's going to be in every Christian's life, the one dominating characteristic that all believers are going to have is God's kind of love. You ought to read 1 Corinthians 13. You ought to see Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And the rest of those words just define what love is. Now, then it continues in verse 12. This is the only allusion to the Old Testament in the entire book about Cain killing Abel. Genesis 4, 1 and following. Now, really, verses 11 through 24 are going to be an amplification of chapter 2, verses 7 through 11 uh, about, about love, okay? <clears throat> and we'll follow that all the way down through. Uh, why did he butcher his brother? Because his own actions were wicked and his brother's upright. A man's actions reveal the source. If we're of God, our actions ought to be love. If we're of the evil one, our actions will be lawlessness, rebellion, unrighteousness, murder, hatred, envy, strife, drunkenness, revelry. By our actions, we reveal who we are. Isn't that what Jesus said when he said, it's not what goes in a man that defiles him, it's what comes out. What he says reveals who he is. What he does reveals who he is. Verse 13, you must not be surprised. Present imperative with the May article. Acts like Cain killing Abel surprise us. When Christians get killed and murdered and, and raped and, and, and they, they lose their uh, uh, financial support and everything bad happens to them, we're surprised about it. He's saying, don't be surprised. The world hated Jesus. The world's going to hate you. Now, you ought to see John 15, 18, John 17, 14. We know that we have passed from death into life, perfect tense, once and for all, uh, because we love the brothers. Love is an indispensable characteristic of God's children. Whoever does not continue to love, present tense, is still in death. Anyone who keeps on hating, present tense, is a murderer. Now, this goes back to Jesus' statement in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. To hate your brother is the same as to murder your brother in God's sight. Hate and murder are the same thing, just two different forms, okay? Now, uh, and no one who is a murderer can have eternal life remaining in him. Now, that doesn't mean that a murderer can't be a Christian. That means that a continual hater can't be a Christian. You see, it's the, it's the habitual actions that John's denying can be Christian. A Christian could possibly murder somebody, maybe in war, maybe in passion, maybe in anger, maybe by accident. But a Christian could not co continue to murder people either physically or emotionally and be a Christian. That's what he's saying. Now look at verse 16. And we know, perfect tense, we've come to know what love is. What, it, what is love? How do we define love? From the fact that he laid down his life for us. Aorist tense, Jesus gave himself once and for all. That's what agape love is. It's self-giving, sacrificial love. Let me give you a few references. John 10 11, 15, 17, and 18. That's the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. John 13, 37 and 38. John 15, 13. Now, this idea of lay down your life is the idea of sacrificial, laying it down. Mark 10, 45. Another good parallel. So we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And this ought is we are bound. It's used quite often in John uh, chapter 2, 6 and 4, 11 and here. We ought, because Jesus did this, we should do this. Now, look at this. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. We're to follow Jesus' example. Now, most of us are not going to be asked to lay down our lives for uh, our brothers. Probably we live in a society where we're not going to be killed for being a Christian. We might have to someday, but probably we won't. So look what John does. He takes that radical statement that we ought to follow Christ's example and lay down our lives for others. But he knows that most of them won't have to do that. So look what he comes back and says. But if anyone had the world's means of supporting life and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how can the love of God remain in him? He puts laying down our life, not on a Roman cross, but on the daily practice of helping other Christians. Now, friends, denominationalism has muddied the water. But if you hate other denominations, even though you may disagree with it, if you hate them, it's a pretty good sign you're not redeemed. Practical sacrifice is what we're talking about. This sounds very much to me like James 2, 15 and 16. Sees his brother in need, present tense, sees and knows for sure, and then closes his heart, aorist tense. The word's bowels here. It's a Hebrew idiom for the emotions. If you've ever eaten Chinese food with hot sauce on it too late at night, you know why that's the, 
the ancients thought the emotions were in the lower viscera. <laughs> now, verse 18, Dear children, let us stop loving in words or lips alone, but let us love with actions and truth. What John is saying is just what James was saying in James 1, 22 through 25. Faith is good, but faith without what? Deeds of love. Friends, don't tell me what a good Christian you are. Show me. Don't tell some brother how much you love him. Show him. You see, the proof is in the pudding, if we could put it that way. Now, uh, verse 19. In this way, we shall know by experience these loving acts will prove to us, future tense, um, that two things will prove to us, that we are on the side of truth and that we satisfy our consciences in God's sight. Now, my translation is using the word conscience several times, but the literal word is the word heart which is the center of the personality for the Greeks and Hebrews. It meant the entire person, okay? Now, our conscience, what does that mean? Well, our conscience are either guided by one of three sources. Uh, we compare ourselves with other human beings and we, uh, we uh, criticize or approve our, ourselves. Or Satan criticizes us in our conscience. Or God, Spirit, speaks to us. One of three sources. Well, how do you know who's speaking to you? Well, listen, verse 20. Because if our consciences do condemn us, God is greater than our conscience, and he knows everything. Well, now, the early commentators said, if you think it's bad now, and you feel guilty, you think your conscience is bad, you wait till God gets on your case. Now, that doesn't seem right, because this whole chapter is on assurance, not on condemnation. And so I think basically what, what he's saying here is, look, you can know for certain that even if your conscience does bother you because you're not loving your brothers perfectly and you're not helping everybody you could and everybody you should, but you're really trying and you have a good heart, I think it's saying God knows your motives. God knows your heart. He knows what the, what, how you feel and what you're doing. God can be trusted to have compassion on us who are trying to live in love, trying to walk in love. I think it's a beautiful passage saying God is on your side. And I think that's what it, the whole context seems to fit that. Um, by the fact this thing, God knows everything, you all see 1 Corinthians 4, 4 and Romans 8, 26 and 27. Notice it says, there are two aspects of this, dearly beloved, if our consciences do not condemn us. Now this is third class conditional, which means potential actions. If our hearts or our consciences do not condemn us. So what we're talking about is the fruit of assurance, okay? Here are the two fruits of assurance. Number one, we have perfect confidence to God. Now, this word perfect confidence is used so often. It's used in 1 John 2, 28, 3, 21, 4, 17, 5, 14. It's the idea that we come, it means freedom of speech, but it means we come boldly to God without fear. We enter his presence because we know Christ and are wrapped in his righteousness, and we no longer fear for our sins because we know God has taken care of our sins in Christ. Then notice where it says, the second one is, we obtain from him whatever we ask. Well, that's a strong statement about a prayer. We obtain whatever we ask. I want to show you a graphic, if I could, that deals with prayer and all its aspects. Notice this unconditional element. He gives us whatever we ask. So often in John, one time in Matthew. But there's other aspects of prayer. We can't just base prayer on one, one passage. We've got to keep on asking, keep on seeking. There's persistence involved, and you see those scriptures. Our attitude is crucial. Are we doing it for our own lust? Are we doing it for the world's goods? Why are we doing it? And then finally, we must really pray according to God's will. And that's what verse 22 is saying. Isn't that exactly what verse 22 is saying? Uh, we do what pleases him. We practice obedience, and we do what pleases him. There's two criteria for answered prayer right there. If you see 1 John 5, 14 and 15, we have according to God's will we must pray. So that I have a sermon I've done called Prayer, Unlimited Yet Limited. I'd be happy to send that to you if you just write for it. We'll send you our catalog too. Now, and that deals with this topic right here. Do I get whatever I ask for? I think the worst thing that happened to us is that God answer all of our prayers. Because sometimes we pray so uh, selfishly and so uh, self-centeredly. No, I think God, obedience. Obedience is a key because we practice obedience to his command. I tell you what, Jesus put it so well when he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? and do not the things I ask you to do? Luke 6, 46. That'd be a good question for most Christians. You ought to walk in the life that you have. You're not responsible for what you don't know, but you are responsible for what you do know. The second one is, and do what pleases him. That's aorist tense. I think it's the idea of, uh, excuse me, do what pleases him. I, my mind just skipped. That's not aorist. That's, that's a phrase we do according to his will. Now, here comes the aorist, the next one. And this, is, this command is this. This is what he asks us. It's singular. This is his command. 
And there's two parts to it, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and practice loving one another just as he commanded us to. Jesus, God's command to us is twofold. Believe in Jesus. Love one another. See both those sides? There's the doctrinal, theological, relationship aspect, and there's the moral, social aspect. Both are crucial. One command, two aspects. Uh, I wish I had time to develop that because I, both those are believe is aorist, practice is present. We believe one time in Jesus completely. We keep on practicing love. Then verse 24, whoever practices obedience to his commands remains in union with him and he in union with him. Now this theory of, of union is going to be picked up again and developed in chapter 4, 13 through 16. You also might, this is reminiscent of John 15, 1 through about 11, isn't it? Uh, and this is the way we know that he remains in union with us by the spirit he's given us. Now we're going to pick up on this whole concept of the Holy Spirit and how we know the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. But basically I want to say this right here. You all see Romans 8, 14 through 16. We have an indwelling Holy Spirit who gives us confirmation. Uh, the Holy Spirit, first of all, helps us to come to Christ. That's John 14 through 16, his convicting, wooing powers. Then he helps us confess Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. And then he gives us a Christ-like walk, Galatians 5, uh, 22 and following. So here we have God draws us to himself by the Holy Spirit, John 6, 44 and 65. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and shows us our need, John 14 through 16. Helps us confess Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 2. And then helps us live like Christ, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Well, I've enjoyed being with you. I ran out of time. I'll see you again same time, same place next week. God bless you.